Hi, everybody. We're back. Can you give me a hello if you can hear us? Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with the next program because, like I said, we're running a little bit behind time because of some technical issues. Um, and I'm going to mute myself and turn off my camera and I'm going to let you get started, Amanda. Okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to AERC Spring Conference. Um, I'm Amanda Snowden. I'm a CVT and the Blood Bank Coordinator at AERC. Um, today, we're just going to be talking about a general overview of transfusion medicine. So let's go ahead and get into it. Um, we're going to talk about who can get a transfusion, what products are available for patients in veterinary medicine, where do they come from, when should patients receive a transfusion and which component should they get? How do we give a transfusion to a patient? And why is having knowledge of transfusion medicine necessary? So I'm gonna start out with a video. Um, it is by, it's Ken Yagi talking. He is kind of the blood transfusion guru in veterinary medicine. He is the co-editor of the Manual of Veterinary Transfusion Medicine and Blood Banking, which is kind of the go-to manual that everyone uses to set up their blood banks and um, to set up the parameters and whatnot. So I will go ahead and have Heidi play that video for me right now. Um, one of the most, most common, common ones that, that I ran, ran into when I started to look into blood, blood banking and transfusion medicine, medicine um, was uh, the first transfusion. Hey, Amanda. Yeah? You're going to need to mute your computer so that oh, the, there's not an echo. Got it. Where do I do that? Oh, here we go. Got it. Okay. Um, actually, yeah. Okay, perfect. Just a sec. Um, one of the most common ones that I ran into when I started to look into blood banking and transfusion medicine um, was uh, the first transfusion is free. And I didn't even know what that meant. That uh, it means that uh, people think the first transfusion, in dogs at least, can be performed without doing any blood typing or cross-matching compatibility testing because it doesn't cause a reaction, which is partially true, but it always leads to sensitization and always leads to delayed hemolysis if you have a mismatched uh, blood transfusion. And so uh, it's definitely not true. Um, and so we definitely want to uh, at least blood type match the transfusions for dogs uh, and cross match as if possible. And um, for cats, it's definitely not free either. So there's all, uh, with cats, even the first mismatch transfusion can cause a fatal reaction. Um, another myth in transfusion medicine would be that uh, DEA1 negative blood for dogs is the universal blood type, meaning that if you have DEA1 negative blood, you can give it to any dog and it'll be okay. Uh, there's so many other blood types that uh, is in addition to DEA1 that we can't really test for in practice, and so we can't really consider any type of blood to be universal. So that's a, a misconception out there. Um, the last one that I'll throw in is that um, people feel like uh, pre-medicating our uh, patients before transfusions will prevent transfusion reactions from occurring. And uh, there's uh, a lot of evidence both on the human medicine side and the veterinary medicine side that says that pre-medication doesn't really make a difference. And so it really puts an emphasis on how important compatibility testing is and good monitoring is for us to, to conduct in order to make sure that transfusion is as safe as possible. Okay, so those were some just three myths that I had heard as well early on in my career. And as I've learned more and more, found out that those are not true. So I wanted to just put those out there for you guys. All right. So the first thing we're going to go over is who can get a transfusion? Primarily in veterinary medicine, dogs and cats are the ones who get transfused the most, especially general practices and emergency hospitals and urgent care clinics and referral and specialty centers. However, large animals, exotics, and wildlife can also receive transfusions. Um, typically with large animal medicine, it's mostly horses 
that get transfusions, um, exotics is also a doable practice. At AERC, we did one whole blood transfusion on a rabbit that I'm aware of and almost did another one, but um, it, it's doable. Their, their blood types are a little bit different or not, not necessarily defined yet, but depending on what the doctor wants to do, it is a potential thing. And then wildlife can also receive transfusions. We also saw a, a bald eagle at AERC that we transferred to the Raptor Center and they ended up giving a transfusion there because the eagle was anemic. So now we're going to look at what commercial products are available in for patients in veterinary medicine. So in 1665, the first dog-to-dog -dog transfusion was done, but it was primarily done to, to study transfusion medicine for humans. Veterinary transfusion medicine didn't really become a thing of its own until the 1980s, which is when the first commercial veterinary blood banks began, and we really started um, delving into veterinary transfusions a little bit more. Whole blood was used for many years as the primary source of transfusions, but the gold standard now really is to use components of whole blood. Uh, this means the blood is separated into different parts to allow us to treat patients more appropriately by targeting specific disease processes. It decreases the chances of fluid overloading a patient or the patient having a transfusion reaction. And the main reason component therapy is essential these days is it allows us to treat more patients with the same number of donations. So rather than, you know, one patient getting one whole blood transfusion, you can separate it into certain components and treat three, four, five other patients. Um, my little triangle that I have here is kind of the, the oh goodness, the components that, um, the blood is made up of. So the largest component is the plasma on the bottom that contains water, electrolytes, hemostatic proteins, albumin, immunoglobulins, and coagulation factors. That can further be separated into specialized components like frozen plasma, cryoprecipitate, albumin, and others. The next portion of blood is our red blood cells. That's the largest portion of solid parts of the blood. Then we have white blood cells, which typically, unless they're separated out by a process called leukoreduction, they usually end up kind of hanging out with the red blood cells or the platelets. Um, and then platelets can further be separated out as well to be transfused by themselves. There's a couple of different ways that they are stored so moving on here, the typical products that most hospitals keep on hand is stored whole blood, packed red blood cells, and fresh frozen plasma. Most of the, the vet hospitals that I've worked at, those are the, the products that they keep on hand. However, there's other ones that, they, that are, can be purchased as well. Um, we can keep frozen plasma on hand, lyophilized albumin, lyophilized cryoprecipitate, fresh and frozen platelet concentrate, platelet-rich plasma, cryosupernatant plasma, lyophilized platelets, immunoglobulins, and human albumin are all products that we can get in the hospital to give to patients. We're going to go into those a little bit further. Our red blood cell products are going to be either fresh whole blood, stored whole blood, or packed red blood cells. So fresh whole blood and stored whole blood are just essentially whole blood. It's what you collect from a patient. What makes it fresh is that it's um, used within 24 hours of the collection. And fresh whole blood has has a is the only one that has active uh, viable platelets in it other than a platelet concentrate. Uh, stored whole blood is blood that's been refrigerated less than eight hours after collection, and it can be stored in the fridge for four to six weeks, depending on the, the anticoagulant that's used and if there's a nutrient component added to it. And then packed red blood cells are red blood cells that have been separated from the plasma within eight hours of the initial collection, and they can be stored for four to six weeks. 
Uh, packed red blood cell units typically have a PCV of about 60 to 75 percent, give or take a little bit. So um, plasma products that we have are either fresh frozen plasma, frozen plasma, or fresh liquid plasma. All of them are plasma that's been separated from the red blood cells within eight hours of the initial collection. Uh, fresh fro frozen plasma is frozen, frozen immediately, and it remains, quote unquote, fresh for one year. That The fresh part of it means that it contains the most numerous variety of coagulation factors. Um, after that year mark, the, f the plasma can remain in the freezer and is usable up to four years after that. So a total of five years after the original collection. Um, it does lack some of the coagulation factors. They become unviable at that time. Um, but it can still be used in many applications like rodenticide, anticoagulant toxicities, and hypotension that's not able to be controlled via other crystalloids and medications. Um, and then fresh liquid plasma is an, another way you can use the plasma. It's separated from the red blood cells within eight hours of the collection, and it's never frozen. It can be stored in the fridge up to about five days, but it quickly loses the viable coagulation properties. And so it's used much less frequently than, than fresh frozen plasma or frozen plasma. I've actually don't know that I've ever used fresh liquid plasma at all, um, but it is a possibility. So then we have other blood components that can be separated out of the plasma. We have lyophilized canine albumin. So that is separated out of the plasma and freeze dried. There's the lyophilized cryoprecipitate, which is concentrated factors, 8, 13, von Willebrand factor, fibrinogen and fibrin fibronectin. We have lyophilized platelets, which are freeze dried concentrated platelets. As far as I'm aware, um, Bodivet has the product Stable Plate RX, and I believe that's the only lyophilized platelet product that's out there right now. Um, cryosupernatant is the plasma that's left over after cryoprecipitate is removed. So it's kind of considered like a, a coagulation poor plasma. It still has applications for use, but it's just much less frequently used because either frozen plasma or fresh frozen plasma has the same things and it's more um, available, more widely available. Um, some of our commercial suppliers have a platelet concentrate, so that's the platelets have been removed from the, the whole blood and they are preserved either fresh or frozen with a small amount of plasma. The frozen platelet concentrate is stored in DMSO and <clears throat> has a minimum of 50 billion platelets per 100 mils is what um, ABRI states. Um, that one should be given over four hours to prevent bradycardia because the DMSO can cause bradycardia from that. Um, human albumin is another thing that we can use for transfusing. It is considered a xenotransfusion since it is a product from another species given to another one. Um, typically, it's, it's much less used and is only done when the possible benefits outweigh the risks because animals, when they do get xenotransfusions, have a higher likelihood of reaction since it is coming from another species. Um, I have two other components that I didn't put on the slide here. Uh, Platelet-rich plasma is another one that is sometimes available. It's harvested from a unit of fresh whole blood that's less than eight hours old and has not been cooled. It's stored at room temperature, but the shelf life is only about five days, so it's pretty rarely used. Uh, the only applications I've seen platelet-rich plasma used for is not necessarily for transfusions, but for like um, joint supplementation and, and whatnot when it's injected, injected directly into a joint. Um, and then human immunoglobulins are also available. This is also considered a xenotransfusion and it can be used to treat immune mediated diseases if, again, if the benefits outweigh the risk. It is very expensive. It's a really expensive product. So it's 
pretty rarely used in veterinary medicine also. So now we're going to look at where these products actually come from. Like where do we get all of our components? Typically, they come from commercial blood banks. Um, some hospitals have in-hospital blood banks like AERC does. And then other hospitals use kind of an on-demand blood collection system. The commercial blood banks that the Association of Veterinary Hematology and Transfusion Medicine listed on their website are on this slide here. AERC uses Animal Blood Resources International primarily. It's where we get our the majority of our components as well as the products that we use to um, collect blood and to bank our, our components. They have a wide variety of things available. Um, in hospital blood banks and blood donor programs, they predominantly bank packed red blood cells and fresh frozen or frozen plasma for dogs and cats. They occasionally bank whole blood. Um, AERC, we just do packed red blood cells and the, the fresher frozen plasma. Um, and a side note here, in the pictures that I've I've attached are the ideal way to store the products. So red blood cells should be stored either hanging like they are in the picture here or sitting upright in a, they make these special kind of slotted contraptions for the, the bags of blood to sit upright in. It allows for the greatest amount of oxygen transfer through the bag since the bags are technically semi-permeable. And that's what really allows the red blood cells to be stored for as long as they, they are, is that, that oxygen transfer. And then plasma ideally should be stored in the boxes like this. It helps protect the bags because the bags are become pretty fragile when they're frozen. Um, and even just moving them around a little bit in the freezer can cause damage to them. So storing them in the bat in the in the boxes, um, laying flat like this is the ideal way to keep the plasma in the freezer to make sure that it's the safest. Yeah. Okay, and then some some blood bait or some hospitals um, do on demand blood donor programs. So what that means is that they screen blood donors. They have a list of donors that they can use, and it's kind of use them on an on-call basis when a transfusion is needed in the hospital. Hey, Amanda, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, it's okay. <clears throat> so we have so many people who cannot get into this webinar okay. that what I've decided to do is we're going to abandon Webinar Ninja this morning. And okay. I'm going to send um, a link to everybody. So even if you're in and you got in successfully, you're going to get an email from me that says spring conference workaround. And we're going to move to Zoom because we have webinar via Zoom. And that's just going to be a lot easier for people. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to stop you here. We're going to end this broadcast. You do have to register. So I'm going to send you um, an email that says register in advance for this webinar. You click that you enter it in. You should get your link right away and we'll reconvene in Zoom. OK. Okay, so we were talking about the on-demand blood donor programs that some smaller hospitals, some general practices use, and even some hospitals, AERC occasionally will do this as well. So what it entails is we screen blood donors and have them on call when a transfusion is needed in the hospital uh, typically it's whole blood transfusions that are given, um, but some hospitals can use, or people can use sediment separation, which is essentially where you just pull the blood, you collect what you need, you let it sit and separate like blood would, um, in a test, in a tube or whatever, and you can separate the plasma off of the red blood cells if you need to, um, it doesn't allow for complete separation like centrifugation does, but it is adequate in emergent, uh, emergency situations if you need to use that. The benefits of having an on-demand blood donor program is that pre-screened pre donors are available at all times. 
Uh, the cost can be reduced per unit of transfused product if you utilize your donors frequently enough. Um, I looked over to kind of get an idea of, of how many times that would be based on cost of screening panels and reimbursement for the donors, as well as how much a unit costs from um, one of the, the commercial blood banks. And it came out to be about three times per year. So if you use your donors three or more times per year, the cost is reduced per unit of transfused product. And that, especially if you separate it out a little bit, even more so is reduced. Um, using on-demand programs also reduces the number of wasted products used because you're doing collections when the, the transfusion is needed to be done, as opposed to storing some in the in the fridge and then things expiring or um, not being able to be used. So like I said, for smaller hospitals and um, emergency vet places, it can be maybe more cost-effective to do an on-demand blood donor program. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what is required for a blood donor? Typically, we look at age, weight, and then some miscellaneous things. Dogs and cats ideally should be between one and eight years of age. We want them to be at least a year old so that they're fully developed, their, their adult size and weight. Um, and we don't wanna do collections on patients that are older than eight years of age because as, they, as our patients age, as we know, they, can have underlying disease processes that we may not catch in time. Their metabolism is a little slower, so they may not recuperate or bounce back from a collection as well as a younger as well as a younger donor could do. So, typically, one to eight years is what we use for for an age range. Some programs use an upper limit limit of ten years for cats because they do tend to live longer than dogs, but that's a little bit more of a as a as needed basis. Um, and then as far as weight goes, we wanna make sure that they're, they're large enough to donate the full unit that we typically collect. Dogs should be greater than 50 pounds. Um, and then cats should be greater than 10 pounds to donate a full unit. The reason being is I have listed on here the the blood volume that each or that the dogs have and the safe amount that they can donate. So we typically try to do, collections are usually about 15 to 19 mils per keg for dogs and cats is about 12 mils per keg. So a 50 pound dog has approximately 2000 milliliters of blood and they can donate up to 450 mils safely. And then a four and a half kilogram cat can donate 40 or 54 mils. And a typical donation is 50 to 53 milliliters of blood. And then our miscellaneous requirements, we want them to have a good temperament. We don't want donors that are get upset at the vet hospital or that are potentially uh, going to injure any of us. We don't want them to, to bite or scratch or anything. We don't want to stress them out. So Dogs and cats that are a good temperament make the best donors. Um, they need to be healthy with no ongoing disease processes and not on any like long-term medications that could um, affect the, the blood. They have to be up to date on all their core vaccines or have titers that say that they are um, protected against those diseases. The cats should be indoor only. This helps prevent from any um, transmissible diseases like FIV or FELV. And the dogs should be current on flea, tick, and heartworm preventatives, and that should be year-round just to make sure that we they don't pick up a tick-borne disease or heartworms in between um, blood donations. So Blood screening typically looks about the same for dogs and cats. Um, a doctor will do a physical exam to make sure all of the physical parameters are okay. We do blood type them to see what type they are. For dogs, it's usually DEA 1.1 positive or negative. And for cats, it's A, B, or AB. 
Uh, we do a very comprehensive lab screening. So that includes comprehensive chemistry panel, CBC, UA, fecal to make sure there's no intestinal parasites and then testing for infectious diseases. So for dogs, it's typically all of our tick-borne illnesses, heartworms and so on. And then for cats, FELV, FIV, Bartonella, coronavirus, um, et cetera. For cats, we also do um, an echocardiogram. We wanna make sure that they don't have any underlying heart problems because cats can be sneaky and, and hide those heart issues. And we just wanna make sure that they don't have any compromise to their hearts before we go and take a large volume of their blood. Um, so if they don't, if they don't pass that, they, we don't allow them to become blood donors at AERC. Um, all righty, moving on. So we're gonna look at can the blood types a little bit. Canine blood types are not super straightforward as far as like how people and cats are. Um, they are DEA, which stands for dog erythrocyte antigen. And there are several different antigens that have been identified. Currently DEA1, which is subdivided into 1.1, 1 1.2 1 and 1.3, DEA 3, 4, 5, and 7 are the, the recognized ones that we are able to test for, but there are at least 12 more that have been described, if not more, including the new DAL antigen, which originally was found in Dalmatians, which is why it was named that, um, but it's been more frequently found in Dobermans and Shih Tzus since they started studying it. Um, for all of the DEA antigens, they are gonna be positive or negative. So that means if they're negative, they don't, the red blood cells don't have that antigen on them. And if they're positive, they do have the antigen on them. DEA 1.1 is the most immunogenic and it's therefore the most tested for. Um, so that would be the one that they would have the most likely to have a reaction to. And then DEA 4 positive dogs that are negative for the other antigens are considered as close to universal donors as you can get. Um, I know Ken said in his video that there aren't, you know, 1.1 negative dogs aren't the universal donor, but from the studies that have been done, that combination with the DEA4 positive and the negative for everything else is the, the universal donor that they've found. Um, to determine blood types, there are two different blood typing kits out there. Um, Elvedia has a quick test blood typing kit, and then there's a rapid vet card agglutination test. Um, I've used both of them. They both work great. Um, it just kind of really depends on what your doctors and what your hospital has or wants to use and what they prefer. Um, feline blood types are a little bit more straightforward. They are either A, B, or AB. Um, type A is the predominant type among domestic felines. Approximately 90 to 95% of cats worldwide are type A. Uh, type B has higher incidences in certain geographical regions and in some purebred cats. Um, I lived and worked in Hawaii for several years and I was, um, I worked in a hospital that I was the, the blood bank, or we didn't bank blood, but I was oversaw the blood donor program. And of the 38 cats that we blood typed there, 39% were type B. And I actually, that was the only time I ever saw a type AB cat also. Um, type AB is super, super rare. It's less than 1% of the entire population of cats. However, they are the universal recipient because they don't react to the other blood types because they have both of those antigens on them. So typing cats is really, really important because they will react to if they're given the wrong blood type. And in fact, up to like as little as one milliliter of type A blood given to a type B cat could be a fatal, could cause a fatal reaction. So it's very, very important that we type cats before we give any blood products, including red blood cells and plasma. So to perform a blood collection on a dog, um, way back when, like 10, 15 years ago, there were these like vacuumized glass bottles with anticoagulant in them. 
I have not seen those for many years because they've come up with these lovely commercially packaged all-in-one bag and line sets, which are typically used nowadays. Um, they are a completely closed collection system with the semi-permeable bags that I talked about that permit the oxygen exchange. That allows the red blood cells to be stored long-term in the fridge. They also contain pre-measured amounts of anticoagulant, which is nearly always CPDA1 for dogs. Um, CPDA is citrate phosphate dextrose solution with adenine. It's a newer version of the CPDA that was previously used and it allows the red blood cells to be stored a little bit longer. And then some of these collection kits contain another bag with a nutrient solution that extends the life of red blood cells by an additional seven days. So this collection set that I have on the right-hand side has two bags for blood and plasma. And then this one on the left has a nutrient solution called Optizolve that when added to the red blood cells, it does increase the, the um, quantity of product that you give to a patient, but it, um, but it prolongs the life of the red blood cells so that they can be stored a little bit longer in the fridge. Um, for cats, blood collections, you want to use 60 ml syringes with or without bag and line set. So there are prepackaged ones that you can purchase. You can also do a blood collection just with a, a 60 ml syringe and a butterfly catheter with a, a three-way stopcock on it if you need to in a pinch. Um, it is not a closed collection system, which means that it has more of a likelihood of bacteria being introduced. Um, and you have to add the anticoagulant to the syringe before, before you can collect the blood. Usually for cats, you use a solution called ACD, which is acid citrate dextrose solution. Um, and you wanna use about one mil of solution per seven milliliters of blood that you plan to collect. Um, at AERC, we use seven mils of ACD solution and we collect 53 mils of blood. So that creates a total volume of 60 milliliters. Um, whole blood and or packed red cells can be stored in the fridge for up to 30 days. We typically do 28 days just to be on the safe side um, to minimize the risk of any bacterial issues. Um, heparin can also be used if collections are rarely done in your hospital and the blood is going to be used immediately after collection. So heparinized blood can't be stored at all, but you can use it if you have to, um, if you have a patient that needs a blood transfusion and you're doing like on-demand collections. So, all right, how to perform a blood collection. So the first thing you want to do is check the PCV of your donor. Um, we err on the side of caution and use a little bit higher of a minimum number for PCV for a patient. Um, dogs, we want to be 45% or higher, um, but it has been noted that they can be as low as 40%. And cats, we want to be, we want them to be 35% or higher, but again, they can safely donate if their PCV is 30% or more. Um, the other thing, when you check the, when you do a PCV is you wanna check the tubes for plasma discoloration. If there's any lipemia or hemo, uh, hemolysis, just to kind of notate that and see, um, to check and, and before you move forward with doing the collection. You also wanna ensure the donor vitals are within normal limits. So heart rate, respiratory rate, check their gum color, make sure that looks okay, make sure they're not running a fever. Um, and have a doctor perform a, a physical exam to ensure that everything looks and sounds okay. You'll want to gather your supplies, including IV or sub-Q fluids. So some hospitals prefer to give their donors IV fluids. Some prefer to give sub-Q fluids afterwards. Some hospitals prefer their donors to have an IV in place in the event of anything happening. Others don't. Um, it really depends on doctor preferences and hospital protocols, really. Um, there's not really a right way to do that. Um, okay, 
So then you would sedate your donor if needed per your hospital or doctor's protocol. So some dogs, most dogs don't need to be sedated or only need to have like minor sedation, but pretty much every cat needs to be sedated. Um, they're, they're less amenable to being held on their side and having a needle stuck in their neck than dogs are. Um, so once you have them all set and ready to go, you wanna clip and clean the jugular vein that you plan to use using a surgical scrub. And then you want to sterilely collect the blood. You know, don't touch the needle, don't touch the neck after you scrub it, all the, the, the uh, typical things. And then you would either use the blood for the patient that needs it, or you would separate it into components and store them. So <clears throat> typically, I know I, I think I went over this before, but it's usually 10 to 20 mils per keg is the amount of blood donation for a dog and somewhere around 10 to 15 mils per keg for cats. Um, after the, the collection is done, you want to make sure that you hold off for a good amount of time after the collection on that jugular vein because the needles we use are pretty large. Um, the reason for that is that it prevents the, the lysing or potential lysing of the red blood cells as we do the collection. Um, sometimes neck wraps are warranted. Um, I personally always wrap my greyhounds because they don't have really any fat to help plug the hole and it takes a little bit longer for them to clot, I've, I've noticed. Um, so they go home with neck wraps and their owners all know that they stay on for about 30 minutes, take them off and everything goes pretty smoothly with that. Um, this is a series of pictures of kind of how the process works. The one on the top left is one of our donors having a blood collection performed. On the right is the entire 450 mils that he donated, as well as the assistant holding off his vein. Um, on the bottom left is the centrifuge that we use. In the middle is the, after it has been spun down, um, I'm using this plasma separator to kind of squeeze the plasma out the top into the satellite bag here. Um, and we do all of that by weight. So um, plasma weighs approximately 1.03 grams per mil. Um, whole blood or packed red cells are a little bit more at like 1.06 grams per mil. Um, but on the right-hand side then is the unit I separated it into three components. This is a double, double unit of fresh frozen plasma and then two single units of packed red cells. So you can kind of separate it however your hospital needs it or um, what, you, what you need to do. So when do patients need, trans, need a transfusion and which component should the patient receive? That's the next thing that we need to look at. Um, they may need a transfusion if they have anemia, um, coagulopathy issues, thrombocytopenia, hypoalbuminemia, uh, von Willebrand disorder or hemophilia A, uh, a variety of different toxicities um, or other traumatic events that have happened. So there are many reasons that we do give transfusions and there's different products that are best used for certain instances. So red blood cell products, you want to give when a patient is anemic and is showing clinical signs of decreased oxygen carrying capacity. So some patients have a low PCV, it's lower than normal, and they just kind of hang out there and they're fine. Their body's used to it and it's okay. But when it becomes a problem is when they are showing these symptoms like tachypnea, tachycardia, poor pulse quality, and lethargy. Those are things that you, you know, you might look at a PCV of, you might have a, a cat that has chronic kidney disease, their PCV is like 16%, and they're just hanging out and living life and they're fine. Um, but it's when they start to show these symptoms like tachypnea, tachycardia and such that would warrant them needing a red blood cell transfusion. So the most common disease processes that receive red blood cell products are gonna be IMHA, any active clotting issues. So ITP, rodenticide toxicity, other uh, hepatopathies, um, active or recent hemorrhage. So anything from a trauma, a traumatic event, 
uh, a surgical issue. Um, cancers can cause reasons for them needing red blood cells. And then again, like I mentioned, the cats and renal disease. So they oftentimes will need a red blood cell transfusion because they, part of their treatment is to receive large quantities of IV fluids, which is going to dilute out their blood. And typically cats and renal disease already kind of have a low P PCB. So that's just something we want to watch when they're hospitalized for kidney disease and watch out for if they need a red blood cell transfusion. Um, I went over our all of the transfusions that we gave in 2021. AERC gave 234 transfusions last year. Um, of the red blood cell transfusions, this is kind of what proportion we gave those for. So active or recent hemorrhage is probably the largest reason. Um, and, and then active clotting issues, ITP was the biggest one that we gave uh, red blood cell transfusions for. And then IMHA, uh, unknown or other things. So um, like things like hemophilia, uh, parvo, pancytopenia, GI bleeds, those were kind of in the other category. And then um, renal disease was a fairly small proportion, but we did a few of those as well. Um, the red bl blood cell products help by increasing the oxygen carrying capacity of the, in the blood. So one mil per keg of packed red cells or two mils per keg of whole blood should raise a PCV, a patient's PCV by approximately 1%. Um, it can vary slightly because not all of the units have the exact same amount of red blood cells in them. You know, as I said before, a packed red cell unit might have 60% red blood cells or it might have 75% red blood cells. So it can vary a little bit, but on average, that's the amount that you um, should look at as far as raising it by approximately 1%. Um, the doctors will typically give you the amount of blood that they want given to the patient so that I'm, they have like a goal in mind of how much they want the PCV raised by. And then after the transfusion is over, you want to check the PCV, usually about two hours afterwards, and then periodically after that to monitor it to make sure that it's not dropping again. Um, plasma and platelet products are given when patient has any active clotting issues or platelet dysfunction. So thrombocytopenia, um, hep hepatopathy, any liver issues, um, hypoalbuminemia, DIC or multi-organ dysfunction and anticoagulant rodenticide toxicity. So I separated out our plasma transfusions as well this past year. And the largest one was either DIC or multi-organ dysfunction. So that kind of, um, I put that in a, in a lump of kind of organ, multi-organ dysfunction, parvo, sepsis, um, anaphylaxis, that kind of stuff. Um, rodenticide toxicity was our second largest one. Um, and then hepatopathy, so just liver issues, either cancer or other. Um, and then a little bit of other issues such as like HGE, um, foreign body problems. Uh, postpartum, we had, we had a one or two patients get a transfusion after um, a pregnancy issue. So those are kind of what you would look for in giving plasma products. So they help by increasing, or I'm sorry, decreasing the PT and PTT. So typically when there's coagulation issues, the PT and PTT are off the charts. Um, you would want that, the product that you give it to decrease that. If it doesn't, um, another plasma or plasma product transfusion may be warranted. So Coags are typically checked four to six hours after a transfusion and then monitored, again, just like the PCV for the, for the red blood cells. Um, but also a PCV should be monitored because if they're having clotting issues or, you know, coags are increased, they're probably going to be losing red blood cells as well. So you want to keep an eye on that too. Okay. So other options that we have for transfusion stuff too is auto transfusion which is a cell salvage technique. 
that involves collecting blood from the patient that has accumulated in either the abdominal or the thoracic cavity and then transfusing it, transfusing it back to the patient. Um, you can do it with things like a, a hemoabdomen from a splenic tumor rupture, but it's very risky and um, controversial because that blood may have um, cancerous cells hanging out with it and we wouldn't necessarily want to transfuse that back into a patient's veins. Um, as a last ditch effort though, it can certainly be used. Um, autotransfusion is better suited for anticoagulant rodenticide toxicity though. At AERC, I know that we've done at least three in the past two years or year and a half on patients that have had um, blood in their thoracic cavity. It's removed via thoracocentesis in a sterile manner and then is given back to the patient um, with a filter, just like any other transfusion and monitored and whatnot. Um, I know I had mentioned xenotransfusion before. Again, that involves giving blood or blood products from one species to another. Uh, one thing, the ones that we use in human or in, in veterinary medicine are like the human albumin or human immunoglobulins, but you can also do it for among cats and dogs. So the usual time when this is done is when you have a bee cat that comes in and needs blood and you don't have bee cat blood anywhere, cannot get a hold of a donor. Um, in a, in a pinch and last, last kind of option is you can use dog blood. Um, it doesn't last in them, like they have about a four day lifespan that the red blood cells will last and the cats will produce antibodies to that. So it's kind of a one and done situation that you can do to try to help them get over the hump of what they're going through and start creating their own red blood cells on their own. Um, so the reasons for giving transfusions that I listed before, they have a like ideal thing that they might need transfused to them. So for anemia, obviously you wanna give a red blood cell product. Depending on what the issue is, either packed red cells or whole blood might be the best option. Um, if they're having a coagulopathy, plasma is probably the best Thing that you would want to give and or whole blood. If they're having uh, bleeding issues and they're losing red blood cells as well, whole blood is a, a very good option for them. Uh, thro this is especially true with thrombocytopenic patients. Um, the only blood product other than a platelet concentrate that has act viable platelets is fresh whole blood. So this is a time when, when we've done on-demand blood collections at AERC is for patients that are thrombocytopenic that could really benefit from a fresh whole blood transfusion. Um, for patients with hypoalbuminemia, they really need albumin. There's not really enough albumin in plasma transfusions to help increase their albumin. So you can give, you can certainly give plasma transfusions, but they really, really need that concentrated albumin. Um, <clears throat> patients with von Willebrand disorder or hemophilia A benefit the most from cryoprecipitate. That's because cryoprecipitate is a concentrated um, product that has those clotting factors in it that they, they so desperately need. Um, the second best option for them is fresh frozen plasma because fresh frozen plasma does have those um, coagulation factors in it as well. And then um, patients with toxicities, um, plasma and or whole blood will be, would be beneficial. Again, like I mentioned with the rodenticide toxicity, autotransfusion is an option. Um, if you can collect it sterilely and give it back to them, it's a good way to um, preserve your products that you have in your fridge or freezer and use them for other patients that this is not an option for. Um, <clears throat> okay. So I kind of copied and pasted these component therapy guidelines from ABRI. Um, you can look those up on their website as well, but it just kind of has a list of the indications and like what the best recommended components are for those, which I essentially went over already, but I just kind of wanted to add in here um, so that you could see those. So there's the canine and the feline ones. Um, <clears throat> so now we're gonna go over how do we actually give a transfusion? Um, 
Initially, what you want to do is ensure that the patient has a patent IV catheter that is large enough to allow the products to flow through. Um, it should be at least 20 gauges or 20 gauge IV catheter for red blood cells. It also should be a dedicated catheter for blood products only. Um, if there is no way for you to put another IV catheter in, um, you want to make sure that you flush it very well with saline because saline is the only compatible solution that you can mix with blood products. Um, you can't give blood products with Normasol R, Pelite, LRS, any medications, anything like that. So anytime you're giving a transfusion, you want to discontinue all other IV fluids and IV medications and only give that product and not mix anything in with it, except for saline, of course. Um, you want to blood type the patient and the donor to make sure they're the same type or an acceptable cross, like DEA 1.1 negative dogs can donate to DEA 1.1 positive dogs. Um, again, with cats, it's especially important to make sure that you're typing them because they can have reactions to very small amounts of, of the wrong type of blood. And then you want to select an appropriate component to transfuse. Um, generally, this is going to be per your doctor's discretion, and then perform a cross match to ensure the, cam the compatibility of it. So all blood products that are given should be cross matched to ensure compatibility. It will significantly decrease the likelihood of a transfusion reaction. The only downside, I guess it's not a downside, but the only, it, it doesn't guarantee the survivability of red blood cells in a patient, unfortunately. I wish it, I wish it did, but it doesn't. Um, there are cross-matching kits available that you can purchase, like this Rapid Vet H1 that I have a picture of here, but you can also do them without, without the kits. Um, a major cross-match is done usually when you're giving packed red blood cells or whole blood by mixing donor red blood cells with recipient plasma. because so you're want to, wanting to see if there's gonna be a reaction between the two. And then a minor cross match is done for plasma and possibly whole blood transfusions when, and you mix the opposite. So you mix the donor plasma with recipient red blood cells to look for a, um, a reaction. So incompatibility is where there's agglutination. So this is what you're looking for to make sure um, a product is compatible or not. Any agglutination, whether it's macro or micro, so macro is agglutination that you can see with your naked eye on the slide, like the two, the two pictures on the left. Um, and then micro is what you would see under a microscope. Um, so any like aggregates of red blood cells that are clotting together or, or sticking together like they are, um, indicates incompatibility and the product should not be used on the patient. Um, one caveat to that is you want to make sure the patient is not actually autoagglutinating first um, by performing a saline agglutination test. A lot of our IMHA patients will be autoagglutinating and so a cross match is, you can't really tell unfortunately if a cross match is going to be compatible or not with those patients. Um, so you just kind of have to, to throw a Hail Mary and hope that it's that it's going to work out okay. Um, all right. One thing you want to keep in mind when you are looking at the red cells under the microscope is not to confuse agglutin like actual agglutination with normal rouleau formations, which are often seen in cat blood. They kind of look like this stacked coin effect. Um, it's that's com considered normal, and it can still um, be considered compatible and used as a transfusion, as long as it's not doing that and the agglutinating with the clumps of red blood cells. So, so when you're giving a transfusion, you wanna prepare the product to transfuse it. Plasma, you wanna warm it until it's, only until it's thawed and all the ice crystals have melted. You usually warm it in a, approximately 104 degrees, give or take a little bit. Um, warm water bath. You want to thaw them in the box and inside at least one or two plastic sealed bags because the bags that the plasma is in are fragile, which is why you want to keep them in the box. And they're also semi-permeable. So if you put them in the water, there is a possibility that things that are in the water can get into the plasma and we don't want that to happen. Um, 
So red blood cells, if you're giving a packed red cell or a whole blood transfusion should not be warmed at all. It can damage the red cells. So you just want to give it straight out of the fridge and give it to the patient um, how it is. You always, always, always use a filter to administer every blood product except the stable plate RX. Their plasma product says specifically in their package insert to not use a, um, a filter. Um, hemonate filters can be used to give small volumes, but anything more than 60 mils that you're giving, you should use one of the inline filters. Um, the hemonate filters have smaller microns. So if you give more than that through the hemonate filter, it can cause damage to the red cells when you're transfusing it. Okay. You wanna calculate the transfusion rate before you start the transfusion, including the introductory rate, which I'm gonna go over on the next slide. Uh, you wanna obtain a baseline set of vitals prior to starting any transfusion, including blood pressure, because what you're doing when you're monitoring a transfusion is looking for trends. You're looking for changes. Like if there's a slight change here or there, it's okay, but you want to monitor like, is their temperature slowly rising over time? Is their blood pressure slowly rising or decreasing over time? Like what is happening over time? Not just a, a one time here, one time there. Um, once you start the transfusion, you want to monitor the vitals every five to 10 minutes for the first half hour of the transfusion to make sure that there's not a reaction happening. That's the window that the majority of the, the scary reactions will happen is within that first 30 minutes. Um, as long as there are no reactions, you can increase the transfusion to the full rate and continue monitoring frequently throughout the entire transfusion. You wanna keep a very close eye on them to make sure that they're doing okay. Um, and then, as I said before, PCV or coags should be checked after the transfusion per the doctor's orders, whatever they, they would, you know, prefer you to, to check. Um, I've seen this done a couple of different ways at different hospitals, um, how to calculate the transfusion rate. This is one of the easiest ways that I've, I've looked at it, is you want to look at the total volume to be given and divide it by almost all transfusions are given over about four hours. Um, most of them you wanna give over that amount of time. You can give them a little sooner. And if you do, you would you know, change these numbers a bit. But if you're gonna give a transfusion over four hours, you want to divide the total volume that you're going to give by 3.5. That gives you your targeted end rate. Um, the reason we use 3.5 is that gives us that little bit of wiggle room to use the introductory rate for the first half hour. And to calculate that, you would divide your targeted end rate by four. So you're giving it at a one quarter of the end rate um, to watch for any primary transfusion reactions. So if you're gonna give 450 mils, say you're gonna give uh, an entire double unit of whole blood, 450 milliliters over four hours, you would divide that by three and a half, you'd get 128 and a half mils per hour. To get your introductory rate, for the first half hour, you would divide that by four, which is comes out to be about 32 mils an hour. So you would give it at that rate for the first half hour and monitor very closely for any reactions. Um, so the last part is looking out for transfusion reactions. And there are several different reactions that we can see. Um, this little puppy did not have a blood related transfusion reaction, but he was just an allergic reaction puppy that I had a picture of, so I used him. <laughs> um, the, the, the reaction that, we, that comes to mind the most frequently is a non-hemolytic immunologic reaction. And that is what this little puppy looked like. They are acute, they're caused by antibodies to either platelets, white blood cells, or plasma proteins. Um, they look like an allergic reaction. So they're gonna have angioedema, that swelling of the face. They're gonna have hives, um, a fever, vomiting, diarrhea. It's very, very typical um, allergic reaction. And those are resolved by discontinuing the transfusion, giving IV fluids, antihistamines, and or steroids. Um, the next type of reaction is you could get hemolytic immunologic reactions. So those can be either acute or delayed. The acute ones occur within the first 30 to 60 minutes of transfusion, which again is why that window is so important to 
monitor them so closely. Um, they can be anywhere, a reaction like this can be anywhere from them being laterally recumbent or reluctant to get up. They can have tachycardia or bradycardia. Um, they are distressed, tachypnea, hypotension, pulmonary edema, vomiting, diarrhea, tremors, hypersalivation, and potential death. There is any gamut of, of possibilities for this reaction, which is why you want to monitor them so closely. And then there are delayed hemolytic reactions, which may occur up to 48 hours from the transfusion. Those are going to be indicated by jaundice, fever, anorexia, or hemoglobinuria. So that the body is essentially attacking the red cells that it just received and destroying them, um, which is why they get jaundiced and hemoglobinuria. Uh, the last type of reactions are the non-immunologic -immun reactions. They are ones that are caused by us. They arise as a physiological consequence of blood component contents and infectious agents. So there's five different types of, of reactions or things that can cause reactions. So hemolysis is one, it's caused by red blood cell trauma. So either heating the red blood cells, freezing them, mixing the red blood cells with other fluids or medications, using too small of an IV catheter, forcing red blood cells through a filter, et cetera. All of those things can cause hemolysis of the blood, which can cause a reaction in the patient. Um, the next one is bacterial contamination or sepsis. That is caused by bacterial pathogens in the blood products. So um, either during the collection or while you're setting up the transfusion, um, disconnecting the, the blood to you know, the transfusion to walk the patient outside and then reconnecting them and not doing it aseptically. Um, all of those things can cause bacterial contamination. And if a patient has this, they can develop a fever usually within 15 to 20 minutes of the start of the transfusion. So um, a good reason to monitor the temperature throughout that um, transfusion. Um, few patients can get citrate intoxication, which is where they have a reaction to the citrate, which is in both of the, um, the anticoagulants that we use for dogs and cats. It's in both the CPDA and the ACD. Um, it causes hypocalcemia, so you would want to watch for those um, symptoms of hypocalcemia to watch out for that. Um, they can get hypothermia. Hypothermia is usually happens when a patient receives large amounts of cold blood that's given as a bolus. So say, for example, we have a dog that comes in that has an active arterial bleed and it's lost like half the blood in its body. We stop the bleeding. We, the doctor says, you know, bolus a unit or two units of uh, packed red cells or whole blood. The patient's probably going to get cold from that because the, the blood is, you know, four degrees Celsius, I believe, which is, I don't know, like 40 degrees or so Fahrenheit. Um, so they're going to get cold. So you just want to monitor that and, and keep that in the back of your mind. And then the last non-immunologic re reaction that patients can get is actually the most common one. And it's acronym is TACO. It stands for transfusion associated circulatory overload. It's essentially when we fluid overload the patient with products. Um, this usually happens with small dogs and cats, and generally when we give a product that um, has more volume than what they actually need. So like when we give whole blood instead of packed red cells, or um, we give too much plasma for some reason or another, um, those reactions are resolved by stopping the fluids and giving Lasix. Um, you would watch out for that by, of course, you know, monitoring the respiratory rate, listening to lung sounds. Um, making sure all of those are, are good while you're giving a transfusion. So the last little bit here is why is having knowledge of transfusion medicine important? And it's important because what I have listed up here is the veterinary technician's oath that we all take and agree to when we get into this profession. Um, and having a good knowledge of transfusion medicine is a huge part of performing quality medicine and treatments for patients in the veterinary setting. Um, knowing how to do it appropriately will maximize your effectiveness in providing excellent care and services for those animals so that you can live up to the oath that we, we all agreed to. 
So I just have some pictures here of patients getting transfusions in the hospital and my references. And that's about all I have.